Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to everyone for turning up. Um, thank you to Nitin and the other people who've made it possible, including the people on the technical side. And um, I hope the um, uh, the connection holds up and that um, the technical side of it goes, goes well, as it generally seems to with Zoom. Um, yes, I um, as the, those introductory comments made clear, I've been reading and writing about Derrida and teaching Derrida and thinking about Derrida for uh, many years now. Um, and just recently, my thinking about him has taken a different turn uh, toward uh, poetry or verse. Um, we'll talk a bit about the distinction between poetry and verse. Um, and the reason for that is partly because I puzzled for a long time about Derrida's writing and why it is that his writing is so poetic, which is a very vague sort of term, but there are various ways you can describe and explain the poetic element in Derrida's thought, and it has a lot to do with metaphor. It has to do with um, its elusiveness, its extraordinary sensitivity to verbal nuance, its um, linguistic creativity, its inventiveness. There are various adjectives you can apply in thinking about the poetic element in Derrida's work. But um, I thought it was perhaps worth trying to elucidate and evoke and analyze, to a certain point, analyze that poetic character um, in verse form through a kind of performative analysis, if you like. But I'll come back to that later on. What I want to do is to talk about Derrida's thinking in a broadly chronological context. Um, Nitin has suggested to me that I focus to begin with on his famous or notorious, but certainly very controversial essay, Structure, Sign and Play, in the Discourse of the Human Sciences, which, as it happens, was the first text of Derrida I ever read, way back as, um, as a postgraduate, first year postgraduate student, in Frank Commode's seminar in, uh, at the University of London. And at the time, I was baffled, bewildered, perplexed, confused, and completely clueless as to what it was about. So if you are having difficulty with that essay and finding it finding it very hard to understand exactly what it's getting at, then take comfort from that. Now, I was equally baffled and confused. Um, but what I want to do to put it in context is to look at the, at the historical moment at the particular time when that essay was written and when it was first delivered, as you probably know, at a famous conference at Johns Hopkins University in, I think, 1967. Um, and it helps a lot if you understand the background to that uh, conference and understand exactly what Derrida was doing by intervening in such a decisive and dramatic way. Um, the conference happened at a time when there was a good deal of interdisciplinary debate um, between disciplines like um, literature and philosophy, literary criticism or literary theory and philosophy, anthropology and literary criticism, um, poetics as a, as a broad, historically grounded discipline of thought, and modern literary theories arising from mainly from French developments within structuralism. Um, and the conference was called as a way of introducing American scholars in various disciplines, to recent developments in French, largely French critical thinking, especially structuralism. Structuralism at that time was the buzzword. It was um, a fashionable, a widely mistrusted, even feared um, new appearance on the theoretical scene. Um, it was resisted to a certain extent by traditional scholars, partly because they'd been trained up in mainly historical methodologies. The assumption in many humanistic disciplines at that time was that the way to study a topic was to, let me switch this to gallery view because I can just see my own face, which is a bit off-putting. Oh, there we are, that's better. I see more faces now. Yeah. So up to that time, the emphasis had been on the diachronic. Diachronic means um, extended over time, if you like, developmental, historical, um, 
Uh, it implies change with time over a certain period, short or, or lengthy. But the assumption in linguistics, in literary scholarship, um, in many of the human sciences, um, including some branches of philosophy, was that the best way to understand something in its present state of development was to look at its genealogy or its prehistory or the series of historical developments that had led to where we are now. What the structuralist revolution brought about at that time was a shift to the synchronic pole. In other words, an approach to let's begin with language and linguistics because that's where the structuralist revolution had its source. Um, it was a switch to the idea that the way to understand something is through its systemic aspect, the way that one part of it or one component um, or one functional attribute of it related to other parts or components or attributes. So you didn't you didn't study it as an historical, developmental, diachronic um, series of developments. You studied it as a set of structural relations, differences, um, distinctions, internal articulations. And this idea was pioneered by um, a French, well, a French Swiss uh, linguist, Ferdinand de Saussure who is, if you like, the, the founding father of structuralism. Um, and so Sears' idea, which was very influential on Derrida's early work, it was a, a major part of his um, theoretical armory, if you like. So Sears' idea was that if linguistics was going to become a science, if it was to claim genuine scientific status, rather than being um, a loose assemblage of ideas, historical observations, um, detailed case studies um, within a broadly historical evolutionary um, uh, schema, then it had to take a synchronic view. Now, an important point to grasp at this point is that Saussure was speaking as a linguist and a linguist with a very specific set of interests and priorities. So Saussure was not a dogmatist and the, uh, the position he took um, with regard to the the study of language, was as he he was he was very emphatic about this. It was strictly for synchronic linguistic descriptive purposes. Um, he didn't dogmatize. He didn't insist that it had to be extended as a set of definite prescriptive um, methodological norms. I'll come back to that point later when I talk about post-structuralism. So, Saussure so introduced a series of distinctions which are absolutely essential to Derrida's early work. Um, first was the distinction I've talked about already between the synchronic and the diachronic. So he said, when we look at the way language works, we recognize that it works through distinctions. It works as and through a set of in-place structural contrasts which are what enable language to function at all as a communicative system. So at the level of sound, for instance, he says, if you're studying the phonological structure of language, then you recognize that in each language, in each natural language, there are sets of distinctive terms, um, the opposition between one sound and another um, at the level of the consonants or the, uh, or the vowels. Um, and language works by dividing the sound um, the, the, the range of sounds available within a given system of language into distinctive or contrastive features. So Sewer says this is the way that the human language faculty works. It works on distinctions. So he says, for our purposes as structural linguists, we have to recognize that language is a system of relationships without positive terms, okay? So we tend to think, well, here's a word, and it refers to a certain kind of object or perhaps to a certain concept or perhaps to a certain cluster of meanings. Um, but it only does so, Saussure says, through its distinction from and its contrast with um, other sounds. And the same applies at the level of meanings at the, sem at the semiotic or the semantic level of language. It's through distinctions, contrasts and differential relationships that language works. So the first distinction is between the diachronic and the synchronic, okay? That's the most basic of Saussure's distinctions. He also asks us to distinguish the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the written or the spoken 
um, element of language. It's the words on the page or the sounds that you can hear me uttering now. Okay, the signified is the concept or the meaning of those words and sounds. And again, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, at least if we're studying language synchronically. Um, it is a relation, it is um, a meaning that depends entirely on contrastive um, definitions and distinctive terms. Okay, so signifier and signified. And the third major distinction, there are other dependent uh, distinctions, but these are the main ones, um, is between long, L-A-N-G-U-E in the French, and parole, P-A-R-O-L-E. Uh, long is the system of language. It is the synchronic structure of language. It is language as a whole, as a working articulate system. Parole is the individual speech act. Okay, so it's what I'm doing now. It's what you'll be doing in question time. Um, it is the everyday um, business of speaking straight ahead and making our, our meaning clear. Um, so Saussure, as you can see, was a very systematic thinker. Um, and the point, one of the points to grasp about Derrida's early thought is that he, um, he came on the scene. He wrote his first and some of his most influential um, texts um, under the influence and drawing very um, extensively on concepts that were put in circulation by Saussure. Um, the other main influence on Derrida's early work was phenomenology. Um, and I'll be talking about phenomenology and Derrida's relationship to it at various points in these, uh, these talks. But in brief, at this point, phenomenology is the philosophy of human consciousness. Um, in its literal sense, phenomenology is the study of what presents itself to us, what appears, a phenomenon, something that shows up or manifests itself in the field of consciousness. And phenomenology comes in various kinds and schools and branches, but its founding figure was Edmund Husserl, H-U-S-S-E-R-L, um, um, who spent his entire life trying to develop a foundational, um, he would have said scientific, um, study of the most basic, indispensable, um, integral, aspects of human consciousness. So it was a lifelong, um, highly sustained, focused, concentrated activity of self-conscious reflection. And Husserl was very emphatic. He wasn't doing psychology. You know, he didn't dismiss psychology. He thought it was a perfectly um, valid um, uh, field of study. But he thought that the phenomenologist had to concentrate on structures of consciousness that were absolutely irreducibly human. In other words, structures of cognition or of understanding, things like our consciousness of time. And this will be very important to Derrida, as we shall see. Husserl wrote a book about time consciousness in which he tries to define exactly what it is uh, to experience time as a dimension of human experience. Um, now, Derrida, in his early work, um, says at several points that if there are two movements of thought that are indispensable to philosophy, movements of thought that philosophers have to have worked through and studied and um, engaged with in an active way, if they're to have anything of relevance or value to say, those two branches are structuralism and phenomenology. And the interesting thing, uh, and the thing that engaged Derrida's attention at that time, was that those two movements of thought, if you pursued their consequences, if you really um, examined their implications and followed them through in a rigorous way, um, and Derrida uses the word rigorous very frequently in his early writings. He is quite insistent that he is doing rigorous philosophy. He is not doing anything impressionistic or subjective or free associative, any of those things. He is he's doing what he, he considers to be uh, the most vital kind of work at the heart of philosophical debate in his own time. Okay, so, so you have these two movements of thought, structuralism and phenomenal. And Derrida points out that they generate conflicts, partly because phenomenology is centrally concerned 
as I've said, with time consciousness, the phenomenology, well, Husserl wrote a book called The Phenomenology of Internal Time Consciousness. By internal, he meant subjective time as we experience it, not objective clock time, though that comes into it. But um, centrally, most importantly, it is subjective time consciousness. Um, Whereas structuralism, as I've said, concentrates on the synchronic, that is on... um, as it were, instantaneously existing um, structures of relationship within um, cultural or social or linguistic phenomena. Um, So there's a kind of inherent, uh, an inbuilt tension at that point. Um, Let me um, read you one of the poems. Um, Let's see. Yes, it's, um, it's a poem on page 17. So... I think most of you have copies of, uh, I don't know whether you're reading them on screen or um, or what. Um, It's a short poem, so I thought it was a good one to to begin with. So I'll uh, I'll read the poem. Um, It's called Difference. Can you, have you, can you find that? Page 17. Yes, got it, got it, Difference. Oh, that's it, that's the one, good, good. Okay, I'll read the, all these poems come with epigraphs at the top. In other words, a quote from one or other of Derrida's texts. And this one comes from a book of interviews he did uh, way back in the late 60s, a book called Positions, which if you're looking for an introduction to Derrida is quite a good place to start. And Derrida says there, the activity or productivity connoted by the ah of difference refers to the generative movement in the play of differences. You know that word play, because we'll be coming back to structure, sign, and play in the discourse of the human sciences. Um, And play has the same meaning in this, this text of Derrida. Differences are the effects of transformations. And from this vantage, the theme of difference is incompatible with the static, synchronic, taxonomic, ahistoric motives in the concept of structure. So uh, let me read the poem and then I'll talk about it and explain exactly what Derrida is is, um, getting at here. Uh, The poem is a sonnet, by the way. I've become very fond of sonnets because the form is very condensed and focused and uh, a challenge. See written here, the instant it occurs, that graphic signifier making plain how quickly difference sets off the chain of senses linking differs and defers. How metaphysics trembles, chorus stirs, strange tremors agitate the textual plane, and practice brushes up against the grain, acquire new purchase as old structures blur. Be sure it's a la lettre that you read, make text your law, let intuition go, and see the play of difference exceed all logocentric bounds, as fault lines show time figured spatially, yet space then freed, Dehiscent to rejoin time's halting flow. Um, Dehiscent is um, a Derrida word. He's quite fond of it. It um, it means um, what happens to um, a bulb or a bud or a plant or something natural, organic that grows and then splits. Dehiscent means splitting, splitting along uh, a stress line so as to expose what's inside the bud. Um, Derrida uses it at several points in his early writing. Um, so difference, um, difference is, is a coinage, it's um, a neologism, so it's, it's a new word that Derrida's invented, um, not invented so much as devised from existing words, bringing them together. It's a kind of pun, but it's a pun that has philosophical weight behind it, if you like, a weight of argument. Um, Derrida's point, and he, he develops this um, in his, his early work, um, is that there is an inherent tension between the synchronic and the diachronic. Um, when we study something, when we study a phenomenon like language, um, we are driven in two directions. And his point is that uh, both those directions are valid. Saussure is quite clear about that. Saussure is not saying historical linguistics is no longer of any interest or value to us. Um, Historical linguistics has to do with the way that languages emerge, develop, change, um, branch off, develop new um, sub-branches. It has to do with everything that 19th century linguists considered most important about language. 
Um, the 19th century was the time when um, linguists discovered all kinds of complex, far-reaching, historical, developmental truths about language systems and the way they change, the way their sounds change, the way their meanings change, and their structures. Um, so Sierra is not saying we've got to forget about that. We don't want to do diachronic linguistics anymore. Um, he's saying, yep, that is a valid part of linguistic study, but it had better be based on a sound grasp of the synchronic structural workings of language. So he's quite happy for those two things to proceed in parallel, to develop um, like two trees in a forest, if you like, independent of each other, um, but both contributing to the, to the same forest, which would be the growth of linguistic knowledge. Um, Derrida is more interested, because he's a philosopher, after all, in the conceptual tensions um, that are developed between um, those two and, and within those two branches of study. And that's what the poem is about. Um, so just to explain what, what's happening in the poem, um, différence is, as I say, a pun, and it brings together the two French verbs uh, to differ as things differ from each other, differences between, in other words, and to defer. And that means to postpone or to carry over or to delay or to hold over, if you like, to some future point in time. So it's, um, it's, it's impossible to translate it from the French. And that's why if you look at translations of Derrida's early work, it appears in the French because it is a kind of operative pun. It is, as the poem says, it's something which is intended to create um, ripples or perturbations or sort of momentary fluctuations of thought. Um, so when Derrida uses puns, they're not just wordplay. Uh, many of his detractors, many people who've criticised Derrida, including the people at the University of Cambridge who signed a petition saying that he should not be given uh, an honorary doctorate at Cambridge because he was merely a player with words and a charlatan. And uh, they said lots of very rude things about him um, because they had heard that he used puns and neologisms and wordplay. Um, what they hadn't realised was that his wordplay is very calculated and it is put forward in a context of argument where the different meanings of the word in question have all kinds of repercussions, all kinds of consequences and effects on other words. Um, so, um, so what the poem is trying to do is to, um, to bring out that, um, that structural um, element of play that he also talks about in the essay um, um, Structure, Sign and Play in the, in the Human Sciences. Uh, the last part of the poem, the last, um, it's, a, since it's a sonnet, so it falls into two, two parts, the um, octave and the sestet. The octave is the first eight lines and the sestet is the last six lines. And as usual in sonnets, you have um, a fairly sharp structural distinction there. So there's an argument that's presented in the first part and then summarized, recapped and given a kind of final twist in the last six lines. So um, make, be sure it's a la lettre that you read that line of the poem. This is central to Derrida's work. You know, he um, what he's famous for among people who admire his work, is for reading more slowly, carefully, attentively, and more open-mindedly than most philosophers. Literary critics for a long time now have been devoted to close reading. They've, you know, a central premise of literary criticism, nowadays at least, is that if you're reading a poem or if you're reading a novel, um, you, you don't skim read, you don't simply extract the theme or the topic. Um, you read with a very close attention to the way the language works, to ambiguities, to irony, to any sign that something is going on that's not on the surface, something more, more profound or more complicated or more self-ironizing, self-questioning. So close reading is um, an accepted practice among literary critics. Many, many critics nowadays would say that what makes a text literary, um, well, it's very difficult to say what makes a text literary, but they would say it is that a literary text repays that kind of attention. Whereas you can read, let's say, um, 
a lightweight novel, simply for entertainment. It reads it on a train or something to pass the time and just, um, you know, get to recognise the characters and their trays and get to follow the plot. But um, but it shows that a text is literary if it demands and requires uh, and provokes that kind of close reading. That is not so common among philosophers. And if anything, uh, if, there's, if there's one thing that Derrida's brought to philosophy from literary criticism, uh, it is this idea that philosophical texts, like literary texts, reward um, that kind of close attention, which may introduce problems that traditional readings of philosophy have not introduced. So one thing we're looking out for in Derrida is the way he'll take a text, let's say a text of Plato or of Kant or of Rousseau or of Hegel or of J.L. Austin, the speech act philosopher, or of Husserl, for that matter, the phenomenologist Husserl. Um, and he will find things in it that go against the grain, that go very much against the, 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 the tenor of um, existing commentary. So with, for every philosophical text, whoever we're talking about, all the classic great names, let's say, in philosophy, um, there is a bunch of assumptions of preconceptions, um, assumed background knowledge, if you like, that tells us in advance what they're about. Hume is an empiricist. Kant is, um, um, let's say, a critical rationalist, an idealist, a transcendental idealist. Um, so we think we've got these philosophers uh, categorized and slotted into some available uh, sort of position in our system of philosophical categories. Uh, Derrida is saying, no, they're much more complicated than that. If you read them carefully, and if you don't take for granted which are the bits that are important and which are the bits that are unimportant, then you will find these philosophers are saying things that are strikingly um, at odds with the received wisdom about them. Um, so that's what the poem means by saying, um, be sure it's a la lettre that you read, to the letter, rather than simply reading in accordance with received uh, knowledge. Make text your law, let intuition go. Well, he's not saying we can simply dismiss all our intuitions, because we can't do that. We're too reliant on our intuitions in reading as in everyday life. But he says we shouldn't let the appeal to intuition carry too much weight, because it could be that our intuitions, our intuitions about, uh, about meaning, for instance, in texts or in speech, um, may rest on rather shaky, rather... Um, dubious um, premises. So when he says, let intuition go, he is thinking of Husserl. Husserl makes regular appeals to intuitions, primordial intuitions, things that are, Husserl thinks, self-evident to anyone who can, can examine our experiences with sufficient clarity and sufficient insight. Derrida is saying, look at the text. The text will perhaps tell you that something else is going on. Okay, so let's um, move on from that poem now. Um, and let's talk about this essay, Structure, Sign and Play. Um, as I said, it is a very elusive and elusive text that is difficult to get your head around at first uh, appearance. And that's partly because it refers to a lot of things that were going on in the structuralist camp at that time. Um, First, a bit more background. Uh, when Derrida gave that paper at Johns Hopkins University, he was um, a fairly obscure figure. He was, he was barely known at all in the US. He gave the last paper at the conference, um, and it came after presentations by a great range of very eminent, very well-respected um, figures in various fields. There were anthropologists, and psychoanalysts, and ethnologists, and classical historians and uh, critics of classical literature. Uh, there were um, psychoanalytic theorists and practitioners. There were literary critics. There were philosophers, relatively few philosophers. Um, but the whole point was to introduce French structuralism, this very uh, shiny new movement of thought, to Americans. It was a kind of cultural um, um, advertising um, ploy, in a sense, uh, a very star-studded, eminent uh, display of um, what structuralism could do for the human sciences in the US. 
said there was a lot of sort of background diplomacy going on. And Derrida was invited, I think, as a substitute for um, another speaker who couldn't make it for some reason. And since he was the new kid on the block, he was uh, he was young and relatively unknown. Um, he didn't get much of a billing at the conference, but um, his paper turned out to, um, in a way, undermine the whole intention, the whole enterprise of the conference, because what he was doing was to criticize structuralism in a very profound way. Um, his paper, as, as, as you know, um, takes aim at structuralism, at the, the most um, essential sort of um, uh, working assumptions of structuralist methodology. Um, now, that doesn't mean that he is simply out to demolish structuralism. Um, it doesn't mean he went to the conference simply in order to sort of um, pull out the rug from under structuralism or to destroy its foundations and bring the whole edifice tumbling down. That, that wasn't his purpose at all. And that is not his purpose in any of his readings of the, the classic Western philosophers. Uh, he's not destructive. I think there's a kind of etymological confusion among some of his critics who think that to deconstruct is to destroy, undermine, reduce to rubble um, or to rubbish something. Not at all. I, I think I can say pretty safely that the experience of reading Derrida on Kant or on structuralism or on Husserl or on Plato, any of the philosophical texts he's written about, is to uh, increase your appreciation of the complexity and the depth and the challenging sort of complex, challengingly complicated nature of the reading experience, especially when he's writing about Plato or about Husserl, you suddenly realize that there are things that are more complicated, more self-undermining and subversive, but at the same time more intriguing and evolving. So he's not just out to do a kind of negative uh, demolition job in these texts. And he wasn't with structuralism. What he did basically was to ask people to recognize that that structuralism was, as it were, fissured. It was divided from within. Um, it made a series of assumptions about structure, about the very idea of structure, that in the end um, were not as solid or as unshakable or as self-evident or as, um, as um, manifestly valid, if you like, as they seemed. He pointed out the structures um, were not centered. He pointed out that the metaphor of structure implies that structure has a permanence and a kind of solidity, a structural integrity um, that guarantees it should remain purely synchronic. In other words, Derrida says, although Saussure was justified in establishing this science of synchronic linguistics as the basis for other, all other forms of linguistic study. What he didn't recognize was that as soon as you examine the conceptual preconceptions of structuralism, you see that it is subject to a kind of shaking, a kind of inward, well, he uses metaphors for, for trembling, if you like. Um, the, the, uh, the idea of an earthquake, the, the metaphorical association with earthquakes, is very often close to the surface in, uh, in Derrida's writing, as we shall see in, in another poem in a moment. Um, so Derrida's purpose in this essay is to say that although the concept of structure is fruitful, and productive, theoretically justified and necessary at a certain point in our thinking, we have to recognize that that thinking has to go beyond structure at a certain point. Um, because structure depends on internal forces, differential relationships, connections, contrasts, and so forth, as in Saussure, uh, which are themselves um, fragile and subject to momentary shaking and change. Um, in a way, what Derrida is doing is announcing very early, um, long before the term was invented, announcing the advent of post-structuralism. I'll be saying a lot more about post-structuralism later on, about Bart and various other post-structuralists. Um, but the striking thing is that structuralism is no sooner announced at this big conference, no sooner do you assemble a great company of eminent figures who are as it were, doing structuralism, applying structuralist concepts and methods to their own disciplines, anthropology, psychoanalysis, um, 
um, classical studies, etc. Um, then you find Derrida coming along and pointing out that although valuable and fascinating, these enterprises are inherently unstable. Um, so there will always be something that will shift or complicate or raise big questions um, about the appeal to structure. Um, let's have a look at um, another, another poem. Um, this has to do with force and signification, which is an essay, the title of one of Derrida's um, early essays. Uh, where are we? Um, Structuralism and Poetry, it's page 39. Yeah, uh, this is a little longer, this poem, but uh, not, I hope, too long. Um, yeah, this is an early essay that you'll find in Derrida's book, Writing and Difference, which is one of three texts that appeared in French in 1967, which was Derrida's Annus Mirabilis, if you like. He was incredibly, well, he didn't write them in that year, obviously. He'd been building up these essays um, on related themes. But um, Writing in Difference is the book where he subjects structuralism to the most intense kind of theoretical critique, looking at its terminology, the metaphors involved in the use of the word structure, um, and again, bringing out those um, tensions within the structuralist project. And what he's doing at this point is playing off those two projects of thought, phenomenology and structuralism. Now, the reason he's doing that is that he thinks they both, they're both they both indispensable because they both show us something about language, about literature, about human cultural systems, which is um, absolutely basic. Um, we can't dispense with either project, but we have to recognize that they do come into conflict at a certain point. And the reason for that is that Structuralism is interested in what can be described in static synchronic terms. So that much we've seen. Whereas phenomenology is always reaching beyond that. Um, in the writings of um, Husserl, Husserl's later work, in the writings of other phenomenologists, one of them is Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, who was a French follower of Husserl, who developed Husserl's project in a more creative way toward the, the expressive arts, toward painting especially, literature, poetry especially. Meluponti is constantly trying to explain to us and describe and evoke um, the expressive potential of language. And that's everything that goes beyond structure. Meluponti is, is um, a wonderful writer. He writes um, uh, in, a, in a very beautiful and a very uh, suggestive and evocative way about painters like Cezanne and uh, Matisse. And what fascinates Meloponti um, is the moment in a painting or the detail, the particular detail, or the moment in reading a poem or a piece of fiction where language appears to go beyond anything that be, can be accounted for in purely structural terms, okay? So it's the idea that the very definition of art involves uh, something that exceeds the bounds of anything that had been achieved previously. Okay, so structure has to do with the already done, the already expressed, the already um, conceptualized. It has to do with existing structures. Whereas art, Meloponti says, has to do with whatever there is in a structure that we can't explain in purely structural terms, whatever exceeds or breaks through or transcends the boundaries of any describable structure. And Derrida was fascinated by that. Derrida came on the scene, Derrida sort of came to intellectual maturity, um, at just the point where Merleau-Ponty, in his later writings, um, was, was moving beyond structuralism toward a kind of um, phenomenology of creativity, if you like. And uh, Merleau-Ponty was moving toward art rather than academic philosophy as the best way of reflecting on the human creative potential for exceeding um, existing structures. Um, and Derrida was caught, Derrida's early thinking is caught at exactly that moment. This is what he is gesturing toward in the essay, Structure, Sign and Play. He's saying, if only we can, at a certain point in our structural analyses, recognize that there is something which animates 
or which gives those structures their expressive power but can't be expressed in terms of those structures. Now, the essay um, in Writing and Difference is called Force and Signification. Um, and the word force may sound rather strange, unexpected in this context. What he means by force is expressive force. Okay, so it's what late Merleau-Ponty is, is talking about in those late essays and books. Um, and Derrida is thinking here about some of the achievements of early structuralism. He's thinking especially about structuralist readings of poems. Um, and he's thinking even more especially about critics and linguists like uh, Roman Jakobsen. Jakobsen was a great uh, Czech linguist who wrote um, extensively about principles of linguistics, about structural synchronic linguistics, but he also wrote um, literary criticism. And he wrote a very intensive, incredibly detailed um, um, kind of analysis of poems. He wrote about poems in many languages. He was a great um, um, uh, polymath and polyglot. Um, uh, he read Czech and he read Russian and he read French and German and English. And he wrote about poetry in all those languages. Um, and the way he analyzed poetry was to apply the principles of structuralist linguistics. I'm talking about um, Roman Jakobsen. Um, he did it in a very systematic way. And he, when he read a poem, he would say, uh, let's not take for granted what this poem is about. Let's not talk about the theme or the meaning or until we have gone through all the layers of structural analysis that we can. OK, so he'd look for um, phonetic or phonemic contrasts, contrasts of sound within the poem. Um, and, you know, this is something that um, oh, children learn to do in school. They look for alliteration and assonance and for sound patterns and for rhymes and structures of rhyme, half rhyme or off rhyme. or um, So that kind of basic um, phonemic analysis is something that um, children do. Um, and it's, it's a worthwhile exercise because one of the striking things about a lot of poetry is the fact that the sound signifies, the sound has a far more prominent function than it does in everyday prose. Um, but Jacobson goes far beyond that. Um, he says at every level of the poem, um, if it's a good poem, if it's worth analysis, um, then you find these contrasts of not only of sound, but of sense. At the level of sense, you have semantic contrasts, which are very uh, often binary contrasts, um, distinctive or contrastive um, relationships. Um, you have grammatical contrasts, you have grammatical structures, inversions, reversals. Um, you have all kinds of incredibly complex linguistic patterning. Um, and if you read, for instance, Jacobson's analysis of a Shakespeare sonnet, you find that, uh, you know, the poem has 14 lines, but Jacobson's analysis may run to 30 pages. You have 30 pages of packed linguistic detail. So Jacobson's premise, you know, his, his central idea is that poetry is the kind of language that manages to compress into a short space, um, uh, let's say, a sonnet of 14 lines. Um, all kinds of linguistic functions which we wouldn't usually be aware of in language. They, they, we, you know, they exist in the language as a whole. They exist in La Long, let's say. When we think about La Long, that is the object of structural linguistic analysis, synchronic analysis, um, then we recognize there are all these contrasts and um, internal relationships and so forth and differences without positive terms. But they don't usually enter into speech. They don't usually turn up in parole when we're just talking like this. You know, we don't um, expect our language to display all these amazingly complex structures. They're there as part of the background of language. They're not there as part of the speech act itself. But Jakobson's claim is that po what poetry does is precisely that it manages to compress and to focus and to concentrate all these um, aspects of La Longue into a piece of language there on the page or there in the, let's say, the, the reader's um, internal voice when he or she reads it. Um, now, Derrida is impressed by these achievements and the essay in question, Force and Signification, um, is actually a review of a number of um, French texts by formalist or 
structures. Um, and he admires the ingenuity, the, uh, the amount of linguistic um, detail that is condensed into these readings. But then he raises questions. And um, so I'll read you the, um, the epigraph you know, on page um, 39. If it recedes one day, leaving behind its works and signs on the shores of our civilization, the structuralist invasion might become a question for the historian of ideas, or perhaps even an object. But the historian would be deceived if he came to this pass. By the very act of considering the structuralist invasion as an object, he'd forget its meaning and would forget that what is at stake, first of all, is an adventure. Okay, so um, Derrida is saying you can't simply put structuralism down as one chapter in the history of thought, because structuralism has become too much a part of our present day resources when we think about poetry or philosophy or any aspect of culture. Um, so it can't be just slotted in as part of um, a kind of textbook account of the history of ideas, okay? Um, but then he says, it is an adventure. And I think what he's saying there is that we have to go beyond the, the bare bones of structuralist method. In other words, there's always going to be something that goes beyond any theoretical account of structuralism. It's going to involve speculation. And this is a central concern of Derrida throughout Derrida's work. The most striking thing about Derrida's thinking is that it is speculative. He ventures beyond what it is safe or what is secure, if you like, securely understood in advance. So his readings are adventurous. The thinkers he admires are adventurers. He particularly admires a thinker like Freud. And the particular texts of Freud that he admires are Freud's most speculative, sometimes his most apparently reckless texts, those that go beyond respectable ideas of method or clinical practice or interpretation and involve um, a leap of thought, if you like, a risky adventure. And that's what he values in structuralism, that structuralism by its own lights, on its own account, was um, a methodological and um, to that extent, a secure enterprise of thought. But then he thinks that there's something about structuralism that is exorbitant, one of Derrida's favorite words, exorbitant. It goes beyond the domain of safe applied method into um, speculative reaches, if you like, that open up all kinds of unguessed at, unforeseen possibilities. So the second epigraph, he says, Thus, the belief and design of structures appears more clearly when content, which is the living energy of meaning, is neutralized. Somewhat like the architecture of an uninhabited or deserted city, reduced to its skeleton by some catastrophe of nature or art, a city no longer inhabited, not simply left behind, but haunted by meaning and culture. So, um, he says, after that's a rather strange, strange passage in a way. Um, it is clearly um, critical of structuralism in some way, but it is not saying we must dump structuralism or jump straight to post-structuralism, as many post-structuralists were to argue shortly after this. Um, he's saying its effect on the poem or its effect on creative, um, creative speech or creativity generally um, is a peculiarly uh, deadening effect, if you like. Um, so it was that that um, that image of the uninhabited or deserted city that sort of caught my my imagination. I'll read you the first of the poems. Um, a ruined city, buildings all intact, its structures undisturbed, horizon still skyscraper packed, yet with no crowds to fill its streets and squares, no movement to attract the gaze, no sign of life. The city sacked, laid waste by nature or by human will, the drive of mutant capital. Just kill all living things, keep concrete assets stacked. That's how they strike me, poems after they've received the structuralist treatment. A critique alert to every slightest detail, save whatever vital power required you seek that poem out. Whatever, whatever in it gave that form the living energy to speak. Um, so the, the point of italicizing the word that uh, twice over in the last couple of lines is that um, Derrida is saying there's something about particular poems. There's something about the effect of reading that Shakespeare sonnet or 
to take some other poems that Jakobsen read, uh, that poem of Yeats or that poem of Baudelaire. Um, there's something about them that is unique and distinctive, memorable and powerfully communicative uh, beyond anything that a structural account can provide. And that's why he says that um, that a structuralist reading, even the, the most linguistically informed and powerful structuralist reading, um, like those of Jacobson, um, will always be felt to stop short, at least to anyone who has read the poem in a way that's responsive to its living energies. Um, now, the language of this essay is, is it's very early Derridian. I think later De Derrida would not have allowed himself words like force or vital power or um, um, what is it, um, the living energy of meaning. But nevertheless, that tension between structure as something static and living energy as something that goes beyond structural description, um, it really sort of haunts Derrida's early writing. And that helps to explain structure, sign and play, uh, the, the text we're, we're talking about at the moment. Um, as I say, it's a very obscure, very opaque text um, until you realise that what's going on behind it, um, what Derrida is really engaging with, is this this um, this um, playoff, if you like, or this standoff, more like, between structure and whatever exceeds the grasp of, uh, of structure. Um, so let's go on to the second second of these these poems on page forty. And yet, um, this is obviously in these poems. I'm often speaking in Derrida's voice, or I, I'm um, impersonating Derrida, if you like. So. Um, when he uses, when the poems use the first person pronoun, I, it's not me, it's, um, it's Derek. It's a good principle generally when you're reading poems, lyric poems, when they use the word I, uh, the pers first person pronoun, to not to assume that this is a poet, you know, the poet him or herself expressing his or her own emotions. There's always that doubt. Lyric poetry is much more ambiguously placed than that. It's very often... There's very often an implied third party involved. There's the, there's the persona speaking in the poem, the assumed persona, if you like, and there's the addressee who may be a fictive addressee, and there's an implied third person listening in to whom the poem is also addressed. So it's a complex thing. But in this case, the I is very often Derrida. So the second of the poems on page 40. And yet, how think the poets vouloir dire their will to mean, once launched in lyric flight, could by that power alone achieve the height of pure expressiveness, and so rise clear above those structural features that, for mere quotidian tasks and purposes, just might be all there is to language, but whose blight lies heavy on the bard or balladeer. We fancy with Rousseau that living speech took rise from music, music from the throes of passion, sad or joyful, yet with each advance we learn again how structure goes far back and down beyond expression's reach, and names the scent of every lover's rose. So traditional lyric metaphor there. Um, so what that's about is um, this, this double imperative that Derrida finds in language. On the one hand, the imperative to explain so far as you can how language can operate through these structures of difference and contrast and relationship, but at the same time to locate, as far as you can, the points at which language reaches or stretches or... Um, um, sort of um, yeah, reaches beyond those structures to appeal in a much more um, direct and powerful and sort of creative way. Um, okay, so what's happening in structure, sign and play is that Derrida is um, questioning the notion of structure. He says that as soon as you lean a little more heavily on the central terms of the structuralist enterprise, you find that um, you set up a kind of systemic shaking or uncertainty or a set of um, terms that all of a sudden lose their clear and univocal meaning and turn out to mean something far more complex um, and to have far more, well, if you like, far reaching problematic implications. Um, another part of the background, the essential context of that early essay is Derrida's by now quite famous, um, initial indecision as to which way he should go in his thinking. Um, he describes it in, in simplified terms as the choice between Joyce and Husserl. Uh, 
um, which seems a very strange sort of choice to make. And in a way, it's a choice that Derrida never made because he pursued both paths at the same time. Um, when he was asked in an interview um, whether he was a literary writer or a philosopher, um, he didn't just say both, which is what you might expect him to say. Um, he said that he was torn and remained torn, and so far as he could see, he would remain torn, um, between two vocations. And he described this very much in vocational terms. And broadly speaking, it's the two vocations of philosopher or writer. Um, now, you might say, well, philosophers write, you know, they write down their thoughts, they write articles, they, um, they engage in debates which appear in volumes of discussion and so forth. Um, Derrida meant something more than that. Derrida said this at a time, the late 1960s in France, and more specifically, really, in Paris, um, where the idea of writing, écriture in French, took on a very special valence. It didn't just mean writing. It didn't just mean writing things down rather than speaking them. It meant engaging in a practice of writing that took language out beyond uh, normal or everyday or received modes of communication. Um, écriture was used in that way by a literary critic like Roland Barthes, who wrote a lot about um, the way that new, let's say, modernist forms of writing could um, question and um, revolutionize our ways of thinking, our ways of thinking about society, for instance. It had a very strong political edge, some of this theorizing. Um, so écriture wasn't simply um, a term that applied to all forms of inscription, all ways of writing things down instead of simply speaking them. Um, it was, for these intellectuals, um, a practice of writing that set out to question uh, receive ways of thinking and speaking. There were some very large claims made for the power of writing to revolutionize society. And looking back on them from this vantage point, you know, almost half a century on, they might come to seem, well, never full half century on, they might come to seem very quixotic, very um, far fetched, idealistic. Um, but at the time, um, you know, they, they felt very exciting. Um, and they were very new, and they seemed to draw on the most um, uh, forward-looking and revolutionary aspects of the, the human sciences that they were developing at that time. So a group of people um, gathered around a journal called Tel Kel, um, um, a Paris-based uh, journal, uh, which included art criticism, literary theory, more speculative kinds of anthropology, a lot of psychoanalytic writing, um, inspired by Freud via Jacques Lacan, the uh, French um, psychoanalyst. Well, he's often described as a structuralist psychoanalyst or psychoanalytic theorist. Uh, but certainly he is very, um, uh, very much dependent on the ideas of Saussure, the relation between signifier and signified. Um, so Lacan and, well, his, um, his students and followers were associated with Telkel. Derrida published some of his most important early essays in Telkel. Um, um, uh, Bart was associated with it, Julia Kristeva, uh, the psychoanalytic feminist critic, um, Philippe Soler, her husband at the time. Um, it was um, a hotbed of largely left-wing, semiotic, structuralist, critical, theoretical activity. And Derrida, although he never, Derrida was not a great joiner. He didn't join up with movements or declare himself a follower of this or that um, uh, guru or theoretical development. He was much more cagey and uh, much preferred to keep a distance from all these things. But he wrote for Telkel, and to that extent, he identified broadly with their aims and their theoretical ideas. Um, and one of the signs of that in Derrida's work is um, his um, use of that word writing. Um, so writing comes to assume for Derrida um, a great uh, prominence and uh, salience uh, in, his, in his work. So when he says that he was faced with this choice, with this uh, dilemma really, uh, between um, whether to follow the path of James Joyce or of, um, or of Husserl, um, he's presenting that choice in the most starkly um, uh, dualist or binary terms. So Joyce, for Derrida, and for many of these French critics around this journal, 
telco. Joyce was the very embodiment and the um, the epitome of, of writing in that sense. Joyce, and they're thinking of Finnegan's Wake especially, and Finnegan's Wake had a great cachet. It had great um, uh, significance and cultural um, appeal uh, for these critics. They think of Finnegan's Wake as the ultimate text in certain respects, because Finnegan's Wake famously um, opens writing um, to the play of uh, a maximum range of languages, multiple meanings, um, condensed uh, puns, um, all kinds of uh, highly inventive, highly creative, imaginative extensions of the range of what language is able to do. So, you know, if you go to Finnegan's Wake for the story, for the plot or for character, you, you know, you, you just won't find those things. You'll, uh, you'll throw the book away very quickly in, uh, in, in patience. Um, what you go to it for is, is the extraordinarily uh, sort of inventive, uh, creative, linguistic intelligence behind it, doing all these extraordinary, often very baffling and obscure things with language. Um, so Finnegan's Wake and uh, Joyce's writing generally um, attained this uh, this position of uh, extreme celebrity among among these French readers. They wrote a lot about it and um, certain passages, especially of Finnegan's Wake. Um, and they found all kinds of um, uh, things to say about it, from a uh, partly from a structural linguistic, but largely from a psychoanalytic um, point of uh, point of view. Um, but the uh, the point I'm making is is that when Derrida says Husserl or Joyce. Um, he's saying, on the one hand, Joyce and this proliferation of meanings, this incredible cornucopian uh, generation of multiple meanings within the text. On the other hand, Husserl. And he thinks of Husserl as being the opposite, the diametrical opposite of Joyce, because what Husserl is doing is trying to pare away or to, um, to remove all these accretions of culture and language. He's trying to get philosophy to focus on human consciousness, the transcendental structures of human consciousness, the most basic structures of cognition, uh, the experience of time, language, what it is to, to speak and be understood. Um, and ultimately, um, well, Husserl was trained as a mathematician, his early training, and he always said throughout his life that what he wanted to do was to emphasize the scientific aspect of, um, of phenomenology. What is it that enables us to understand mathematical propositions? What is it that enables us to have a, a grasp of scientific concepts? Um, so he wanted phenomenology to be um, a rigorous intellectual discipline of thought. So when, when um, Derrida says in this rather um, strange and um, uh, sort of dramatic way, I was faced with this choice between Husserl and Joyce, what he means is I was faced with the choice between two things that I felt I could do, Derrida that is. Um, I could be a writer and I could be a writer in this distinctively tell sense. Um, writing the kind of text that would be um, intriguing, deep, baffling, that would exploit resources of language hitherto unexploited in fiction or poetry, for that matter. Um, on the other hand, I could be like Husserl. And Derrida, after all, had spent his formative or some of his early formative intellectual years working on Husserl. He went to Louvain, where the um, uh, the Husserl archives were, including vast amounts of material unpublished during Husserl's lifetime. Um, and he thought of Husserl as being the very emblem, if you like, the epitome of um, philosophy, philosophy as a conceptual discipline tightly focused on certain well-defined problems. So the very opposite of the Joycean text the Joycean proliferating text of multiple meanings and infinite layers of um, of, uh, of semantic uh, sort of condensation. Uh, on the other hand, the idea of the philosopher as someone whose task it is to focus narrowly and not to allow such things about language to distract him or her from the task of philosophy. Um, so let's have a look at, um, let's see, where are we? Uh, yeah, page 104. I won't read the whole poem, but um, this is a poem about Derrida's relationship to Joyce and um, and Husserl. 104, yeah. 
Okay, so the, the first epigraph is the passage I was talking about, um, where he, uh, he presents the two possibilities for his own work in terms of that contrast between Joyce and Rousseau. There is, he says, a choice of two endeavours. One would resemble that of James Joyce, to repeat and take responsibility for all equivocation itself, utilising a language that could equalise the greatest possible synchrony with the greatest potential for buried, accumulated and interwoven intentions within each linguistic atom. The other endeavour is Husserl's, to reduce or impoverish empirical language methodically to the point where its univocal and translatable elements are actually transparent. Now, almost every word of that passage has a weight of significance. Um, so, uh, Joyce, yeah, it's interesting, he says, take responsibility for all equivocation itself. So equivocation is punning language, ambiguous, polysemous, overdetermined language in Freudian parlance. But uh, take responsibility. In other words, um, although language plays, although there is this element of play, that is most pronounced, most prominent in, in Joyce's writing, um, still is something that, to some extent at least, realises the writer's intention. Uh, take, that will strike many readers as being a strange phrase to use, take responsibility. Um, nevertheless, I think it tells us something important about his use of the word play in the essay structure, Sign and Play. Uh, many of Derrida's critics um, seize on passages like that, they seize on the word play, and they say, this man is just playing games. Um, if you read the letter that was sent to the um, authorities in Cambridge by the people who signed the letter saying that Derrida should not um, be awarded a, an honorary doctorate at Cambridge, uh, they seized on that word play. They said, this man is just playing. He's a charlatan. He is misleading students and others by allowing language to simply lose itself in a free play of the signifier. OK, this is all sort of post-structuralist parlance. Um, so they took the word play to mean free play. Um, now, Derrida does use the word free play, but it's important to see that um, in that essay, in Structure, Sign and Play, he doesn't mean play in the sense a kind of irresponsible, unconstrained, totally licentious um, exercise, if you like, in um, in playing havoc with texts. Uh, he's not saying any reading goes. One of the most important points really to grasp about Derrida is that he's not a relativist. He's not a full-scale relativist. Um, as far as he's concerned, there are responsible readings and irresponsible readings. He uses that word, if you notice, in the epigraph that I read you just now, to take responsibility for all equivocation itself. Um, now, that's pretty explicit about what he's doing, um, taking responsibility for free play. In other words, he's not saying the text means different things to different readers, therefore any reading is as valid as any other. Uh, very often when you read essays about Derrida, hostile essays, um, attacking him for being irresponsible, um, they home in on this idea that he says anything goes. You know, any interpretation is as good as any other interpretation. Since different readers will always come up with different ways of reading texts, whatever the text, um, anything is acceptable. Uh, he, he he couldn't be further from saying that. Um, once we, we get round to looking at Derrida's specific readings of Rousseau, of Plato, of Mallarmé, of Husserl, well, we find that, um, in fact, he is meticulous. He is close focused. He looks at individual passages, then he puts them back into the context of the entire text. Um, and he's quite insistent that there are good and bad ways of reading. A good way of reading a text is one that takes, well, there are two, there are two um, precepts, if you like. There are two principles for the Derridium reading. One is that the reading of a text will involve taking account of as much of the text as possible. In other words, don't miss bits out simply because they don't fit your reading, okay? If you come across um, a passage that doesn't fit your reading, then throw the reading out, or rather complicate the reading to, to, to take um, cognizance or to, to make allowance for that problematic detail. So regularly, in the course of reading one of Derrida's essays, you will find 
he quite suddenly and startlingly um, latches onto a phrase in the text um, which says just the reverse of what you're expected to say, or just the reverse of what the commentators have said previously about it. So it's again, it's that point that every text comes with uh, a kind of baggage of previous commentaries. There is a kind of presupposed commonsensical shared pre-understanding of what the text is about. Um, but if you read text carefully, he says, it's kind of wager that Derrida makes. If you read text really carefully, you'll find there are details there and they may be hidden away. They may be sort of tucked away in parentheses, you know, between brackets or in a footnote or in an obscure text, perhaps a short essay that's not received much philosophical attention. Um, and he says that's the place to look. Sir, so you are you muted. Muted yourself, sir. Uh, you are not audible. You muted yourself. Oh, right. Yeah. Could you hear? You. you could hear me before. Could you? Uh, about five seconds ago, we stopped. Five seconds. Oh, that's okay. Good. I thought perhaps we switched off all the time. That would that would be sad. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So um, his principle is that um, uh, that. That there are texts, he's not questioning the idea that there are important classic philosophical texts or literary texts for that matter, but he is saying that the way we read those classics tends to be that we underread them. We read them in accordance with um, a set of priorities and um, taken for granted assumptions, which are exactly what we should be questioning. And his wager is that if we make a point of looking at details that might appear quite minor, quite uh, incidental or trivial, then we may well find that those are the details that contain the most, um, if you like, disturbing, unsettling, um, the most uh, counter-canonical uh, implications. So Margins of Philosophy is a book that, um, that does exactly that. It has essays on, uh, in particular, um, an essay called White Mythology about, I'll, I'll talk about this later anyway. Um, so um, what he's doing then is playing off two projects in a way in his own work. Um, and I'll read you um, uh, the poem on page 104 that I began talking about a little while ago. Um, this is about Joyce and Husserl. Um, so this is Derrida speaking here. It's uh, The poem is projected into his um, into his, his voice. Two ways it might have gone with me, two quite distinct, you could say diametric tracks my life's work might have taken, though it smacks of pride to say as much and does invite the quick repost that I've gone on to write so much that bears the message, just relax your categories, make the library stacks your happy hunting ground and take delight in jumping borderlines. So write like Joyce when that's your wish, but carry on your twin, long-standing and no-wise conflicting choice to do philosophy. Yet do it in your own distinctive register or voice and show those ancient rivals near akin. Um, so, um, yeah, he did see this choice as being a choice between being a literary figure, that is, a writer in that charged special sense of the term that I was talking about, and being a philosopher in the Husserlian sense, someone who would focus in a very specialised, rigorous, you might say rather narrow form, on um, a certain preconceived task, that of providing philosophy with new grounds and um, foundations. Um, okay, so, yeah, so that first poem says... You know, this is one idea people have of me, of Derrida, that is. You know, I just sort of hop across. I hop across from philosophy to literary theory or to writing in that strong sense of the term. Um, but in fact, um, he, in many of his early writings, denies that he's doing that. He's not simply removing distinctions, disciplinary distinctions. He wants to be a good philosopher and a good writer. Um, and he's going to... Um, demonstrate that in his work. Um, now this, I think this is what has made Derrida's work very difficult for many 
analytic philosophers or many mainstream academic philosophers, uh, the fact that he is doing two things and doing them simultaneously and doing them not in a way of mixing them up deliberately so there's no longer any borderline or disciplinary distinction between them. Uh, he's doing it in a very productive, in the form of a, a productive interrogation from both sides of that distinction. De Derrida is a performative writer. In other words, he doesn't simply write down philosophical ideas or rehearse philosophical arguments um, in a straightforward way. He also enacts what he's talking about. He does things with words. We'll come back to talk about Derrida and J.L. Austin because the English philosopher J.L. Austin wrote a book called How to Do Things with Words, where he talks about the performative dimension of language. Um, and performative means that when you say something, your way of saying it um, is itself a part of what you say. In other words, you are performing by enacting in the process of saying it um, what you're talking about. You're offering an example or you are... Um, reflecting on what you're saying and managing to communicate it through the performance of that speech act in the very action of writing. Derrida was fascinated with that distinction and I think it helps to show us just what came out of this idea of his that one could both be a writer and be a thinker. One could be, one could follow Joyce's path, not in Joyce's direction necessarily, but one could explore the possibility of language to open up new ways of addressing, um, analyzing, discussing, um, reflecting on philosophical problems in a way that wouldn't just be um, in set piece philosophical terms. It would be a much more literary way of exploring these topics um, without losing the rigor that should characterize good philosophical thinking. So we'll come back to the idea of um, of performativity. Um, so let's 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 go back now for a little while anyway to um, structure, sign, and play. This um, early essay of Derrida. Um, it made enormous um, an enormous Im impression on American academics, especially literary critics and theorists. Um, as I said, Derrida was largely unknown. He was really quite. He was young, and he was. Um, he'd done very specialized work in the Husserl archives. And so when he turned up at the conference, he was given the last paper. He was the last slot in the conference schedule. And that gave his paper all the more intact, uh, impact because he came at the end of a series of expositions of structuralist method, um, including uh, the methodology of Levi Strauss's structural anthropology. And as you'll know, Derrida takes aim very specifically in Structure, Sign and Play at the project of structural analysis as applied to anthropology. Um, Levi-Strauss was an immensely influential, hugely productive, very important um, anthropologist um, who basically applied the concepts of Saussure's structural linguistics to anthropology. And his basic idea was that if you're doing anthropology, you have to cope with this extraordinary range of material. You'll be speaking about myths, rituals, so-called primitive cultures. You'll be talking about narrative forms, about kinship systems, about marital customs, about uh, culinary systems, you know, um, the ways that people cook, the kinds of food they eat with other kinds of food, the combinations and the um, the various um, forms that the incest taboo has taken in different cultures. Um, so certain very specific laws that are, so far as we know, transcultural and universal, others that are much more culture specific. So there's this fantastic range of materials that the anthropologists can, uh, might have to take on board. And Levi Strauss asked the simple question, how can we cope with it? How can we reduce it to order or to some kind of manageable framework of concepts. His answer is structuralism. Um, he had read Saussure, he would read Jacobson, uh, he was very aware of the uh, linguistic bases of structuralist thinking, and he says basically, what if we extend this to culture in general? Um, and this of course was the, the aim of the conference at Johns Hopkins. It was to say structuralism is new, it's exciting, and what's more, it enables us at last to be truly interdisciplinary. 
You know, up to now, the different disciplines have occasionally had friendly exchanges of ideas and methods once in a while, but it's never been on a systematic basis. Now, at last, on the basis of Saussurean linguistics, signified, signified, long parole, um, we can, um, at last, on the basis of those binary distinctions, do truly interdisciplinary work. So Levi Strauss says that if you examine the great mass of world, let's say you take two, two narratives, let's say, um, um, uh, an ancient narrative, like, well, let's say the ancient Greek um, narrative of Oedipus, and then look at modern popular fiction, perhaps, or a 19th century novel, or um, just take from any culture at any stage in its historical development. And we will see that beneath the surface differences, of course, they're different on the surface. They have to do with different cultural um, norms and so forth. But beneath it, you will find a kind of substructure, um, a sub um, textual element. Um, which you can describe in formal structural terms. It has to do with conflicts, conflicts of priority, conflicts of belief, conflicts of religious commitment, um, the conflict between different cultural priorities. So in the case of ancient Greek myths, many of them turn, think of Sophocles' plays, Oedipus or Antigone. It turns on the conflict between, let's say, uh, allegiance to the state and to laws, and allegiance to the family and to the ties of kinship. In the case of um, Sophocles' play Antigone, these are played off in the form of, uh, of a tragedy, um, an outright clash of values. Levi Strauss says, if you look beneath the surface variety, then you can find these invariant structures. And this is the central claim of structuralism. And it's something that Derrida was attracted to and fascinated by, and to some extent, exploited in his own thinking, but also something that he drew back from. He thought if pushed too far, then it was too reductive. It was too Procrustean, if you like. It forced things into a, into a certain uh, mold. Um, so there is, once again, we're seeing this, this dualism emerging. There is structuralism. There is, on the one hand, and phenomenology on the other. Structuralism has to do with the, if you like, the cut and dried, you know, the uh, the pre-formed, the pre-established, the pre-conceived. Um, but on the other hand, there's everything that exceeds and goes beyond those limits and that shakes the structure, if you like. Um, so Derrida then gives his paper at the end of this conference, and he takes Levi-Strauss as his um, central example of both the merits, you know, the, the value of structuralism uh, as a project, and at the same time, the limits of, um, of structuralism. Um, now, this opens up a whole additional context, and that is the American context. Um, as, you know, you'll find in any book about deconstruction, you will find a brief account of um, what happened in the wake of that conference at Johns Hopkins University. Um, what happened basically was that um, literary critics had just begun to, um, well, there were two things happening in American literary criticism at the time. The end of the 1960s, uh, there was the waning, the, um, the gradual um, loss of energy, if you like, in that sort of direction, among the old new critics. By the old new criticism, I mean... Well, I mean a bunch of very influential university and college professors in the States, people like Cleanth Brooks and Alan Tate, John Crow Ransom, um, and numerous others, um, who created a set of ideas about literature, um, which was codified. It was really um, a set of um, ideas, priorities, systematic doctrines, really. Um, it was known as the New Criticism, because it was what took over as the most influential way of thinking about literature in American colleges and universities after the, after the war. Up until then, scholarship had mainly been historical. If you were a professor of literature, or of English or comparative literature, your approach would most likely be via the history of literature, a study of influences, trends, developments, um, movements and reactions and so forth. Um, you can think of it, if you like, very much um, um, in relation to what happened to linguistics after Saussure. Before Saussure, it was historical, diachronic, developmental, 
linguistics. After Saussure, at least for many linguists, many structuralist linguists, um, it was synchronic linguistics, the structural description of relationships and systematic differences. Okay, the same thing in American criticism. Sociologically, it was uh, a matter of um, a lot of people, GIs, coming home after the Second World War, uh, people who had missed out on their high school and college and university education because they'd been called up. Um, so they didn't have that scholarly knowledge of the history of literature, and they didn't have time to do a lot of background reading to catch up. So what was required really was a way of teaching people to read poems and novels too, but um, most of this discussion centered on poems, to read them without that apparatus of scholarship, but to read them closely, to look at them really hard. Um, and what the new criticism did was to give these students a bunch of tools for doing exactly that. Um, so they came up with various terms like ambiguity and irony and paradox and some more technical sounding terms like plurisignification. Um, and it was the idea that a poem, um, if it was any good, would reward that kind of very close focused attention. You can see the parallel here with structuralism, what I said about Roman Jakobson and these incredibly close focused, detailed structural exegeses or analyses of poems. Um, the same thing happens in the new criticism, but at a slightly less structurally intense level. Um, so if you read classic books of the new critical canon, um, Cleanth Brooks's book, um, The Well-Wrought Urn, um, he takes it for granted that what you should do, um, what you should best do if you're reading a poem, is not talk about the poet's life or about the poet's intentions or biography or the historical background or the cultural context. That's all extraneous. It is external to the poem and irrelevant to reading it. Um, what you should do is look at the words on the page, so far as possible, quite cut off from background considerations. Um, and you should analyze the meanings, the ambiguities, the structural relationships, the um, analyze them in terms of distinctively poetic things like paradox and irony and ambiguity. Um, so it was, a, it was a formalist movement. It concentrated on the form of the poem, and the poem was taken to be something autonomous, something with its own internal relationships, its own laws of form. Um, and this was, this was, as I say, partly a response to the sociological, historical situation of criticism at the time. Large numbers of students wanting to get a college degree and wanting to have uh, certain tools at their disposal that enabled them to do that. Um, now, this, this went along with a rather prescriptive and proscriptive sort of approach among the new critics. They, they really sort of issued laws of how to be a good reader. Don't talk about the poet's intentions because those intentions can never be recovered. All you have is the words on the page. Um, don't talk about the poet's biography because that is background. If the poem's any good, it doesn't require that you know anything outside the poem. Because if the poem's good, then it will be sufficiently dense, sufficiently ambiguous, many leveled, meaningful, um, complex, and so forth, to communicate its meaning through the words on the page. Now, that this was never um, a very straightforward thing. If you read that book I mentioned, Cleanth Brooks, The, the, the Well-Wrought Urn, you'll find he knows a lot of background history. He knows a lot about the poets. He's, uh, he's writing about, he knows about Marvell, for instance, and Marvell and the English Civil War. And um, so when he claims to find multiple meanings, ambiguities, um, ironies at work in poems, he only knows what to look for because he knows a lot about the way the poet was placed, what was happening historically at the time, what the language was doing at the time, you know, what's um, a plausible, um, viable interpretation in terms of what the words meant in, say, the 17th century. Um, so what you got was a rather doctrinaire movement of criticism. And by the late 1960s, when Derrida came to the conference at Johns Hopkins and gave his lecture, that the there were a lot of literary critics around who were chafing. They were frustrated by these restrictions. They were especially frustrated because the new critics had said, Criticism is not poetry. Criticism is not literature. 
criticism is there to tell us what the literary texts mean. And it mustn't do it in a self-advertising, stylish, philosophically adventurous, hermeneutically sort of speculative way. Um, it has to be disciplined and um, it has to um, obey its own, it has to keep within its own limits. It is an essentially ancillary um, function that it has. Um, now, as I say, at the time, there were some critics around, people like J. Hillis Miller, who is uh, still around, uh, I think, Jeffrey Hartman, who is no longer around, sadly, um, who were beginning to feel intensely frustrated with this. They were, they were creative writers, really. They chose to write literary criticism because they read a lot and because they loved the stuff they read, and they, um, they naturally found themselves writing in a, a speculative way, bringing in all kinds of other concerns, an interest in philosophy, for instance. So if you were a critic like Jeffrey Hartman writing about Wordsworth, you would read Hegel, and you would read Wordsworth's German contemporaries, and you would have a knowledge of idealist philosophy, and of the relationship between Wordsworth, Coleridge, Coleridge's um, knowledge of Kant and Schelling. Um, in other words, they were claiming a much greater degree of freedom than the new criticism allowed with its rather tight and restrictive um, formalist um, tenets. Um, so Derrida's message fell on um, um, ears and minds that, that were eager for some kind of liberation movement, if you like, to put it in, in political terms. Um, and Derrida's um, lecture was, was music to their ears because Derrida is bringing in all kinds of philosophical sources. You know, he's talking in a very knowledgeable, uh, sometimes quite offhand way um, about philosophers. Um, and people like Hartman and Hillis Miller were already reading around much more widely than uh, they'd have been allowed to really under the um, the new critical um, system of, uh, of restrictions. So this explains something of the, the impact of Derrida's paper coming as it did firstly after a series of uh, structuralist presentations and he was raising all these uh, far-reaching questions about um, structuralism and falling as it did on the ears of an audience made up of, um, among others, um, literary critics who were at that time looking around for new, more adventurous, more uh, intriguing and far-flung, I mean, geographically and intellectually, far-flung um, sources of, um, of influence. Um, so um, to get back to the question of play, in one sense, Derrida is saying the play of critical intelligence should be much less constrained. It shouldn't be bound down by any set of uh, preconceived structural complaints, um, uh, constraints, sorry. Um, but he also makes it clear, and I think it, it should be clear from reading that essay, that it's not, it's not simply an exercise in freewheeling hermeneutic commentary. You know, um, it has theoretical content, it has conceptual content. Um, and the best way to think about this um, is to consider another sense of the word play, and that is, or indeed of the of the, the word free play. And that is the kind of play you have in mechanics or in, um, let's say, in a car, the bearings, let's say, in a car or an engine, car engine. The bearings have to have a certain amount of play. That is, there has to be a degree of, of tolerance. There has to be a, a tiny gap. If the gap is too big, you get vibration, you get friction, you get heat losses, you get all kinds of inefficiencies. If the gap is too small, Again, you get friction and you get heat losses, and eventually the the uh, the engine will uh, will seize if it will it will break down. Um, so that that is really what Derrida means by play. When he comes to read texts, when, for instance, he reads Rousseau or Plato, he sees that there are certain key terms. There are words that recur in those texts, and that um, as you read them. Um, they they show a degree of of ambiguity that they they show a play of meaning, um, but not a free play of meaning in the sense just a kind of infinite multitude, a Joycean multitude, if you like, of meanings. What you get is a very precisely defined, very specific um, uh, de degree of possibility for different meanings. And what Derrida typically does in these readings is to show how that. Um, 
that gap, if you like, that space, that difference of meanings turns out to be a structuring principle of the entire text. We'll come back, I'll give you lots of examples of that from Derrida's um, various readings. But um, uh, let's see, um, how long have I got? What, what are we doing for time now, 10.51? What time should I stop, uh, Nitin? Um, um, can we have your lecture till 4.30? We have a few questions in the chat box. So should we take the questions now? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, should I, questions now or shall I talk a bit longer? Um, I mean, uh, you can talk up to 4.30 or we'll take these questions in the next session. Oh, so uh, let's see. Okay, so I'll I'll go on now, shall I? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, right. Okay, well, let's look at some more poems that... Um, that concern this this whole question of play. Um, if you turn to page 28, um, wait a minute, oh, yeah. I've got a great pile of papers here. So, yeah, 20, 28. Um, yeah, it's called Letters. Have you got that? Yeah. So it's um yeah the, the, these poems have to do with the the whole question of uh, well in simple terms of getting it right. Um, many of Derrida's um, attackers, if you like, uh, people who've written in very hostile terms about Derrida, uh, do take play to be a matter of completely free play. In other words, um, a very licentious um, attitude toward interpretation where any reading is as good as any other reading. And as I said, Derrida is, is, is not saying that. In fact, he is very emphatically saying the reverse of that. Um, and in his um, early work, this very often takes the form of um, an allegorical treatment of letters, the whole idea of communicating by letters. He's fascinated by that. He wrote um, called The Postcard, The Postcard from Socrates to Freud. And it's partly a book about Freud. It's about Freud's speculative ventures that I mentioned earlier. It's um, the whole um, aspect of Freud's life work that Derrida particularly admires. It's the fact that Freud was willing to risk his reputation. He would send out speculative texts or uh, communications to the world, which might seem off the wall or strange or weird or wacky or eccentric or overly risky. Um, he'd send them out really on the wager that they would eventually return with interest. Um, but Derrida is interested in communication and miscommunication. Um, and one of the things that philosophers find baffling and um, upsetting about Derrida is that Derrida um, will take a, a binary opposition. He'll take a pair of terms like communication, miscommunication, and he will say, we must always consider the possibility that messages will be misunderstood or misdelivered, that letters will go astray, that texts will um, be misinterpreted, that poems will have some accident befall them. The reason he compares poem to a hedgehog is partly because hedgehogs, although they're bristly and um, can appear quite aggressive, um, are also very vulnerable. Think of the predicament of uh, hedgehogs on the, on the motorway. Um, in, I, I didn't, in, in Britain, every, um, every, every year, there'll be volunteers who go out onto the motorways and the roads and help the, the, the hedgehogs across the road so they don't get crushed by passing vehicles. Um, and one of Derrida's themes in his work, early and late, is the possibility of misadventure, miscommunication, misinterpretation. So everything we say whether we're speaking like this, you know, uh, or whether we're writing a poem or writing um, an essay in literary criticism, um, there's always the, the standing possibility, the perpetual possibility, that it will be misdelivered if it's a letter in the literal sense or misinterpreted in some way. Or if it's a text, it may get lost. You know, uh, not so often nowadays because we keep multiple copies um, when, of electronic texts, but, um, you know, they, there are many stories, many um, very sad stories about great texts that have gone missing. Some of them have turned up later, you know, in some obscure corner of a museum or a library, but uh, some have just gone permanently missing. Um, 
So many philosophers, um, many commentators find it baffling that Derrida should want to, um, to reverse the binary. The standard assumption is that there's a natural way around for binary distinctions. Um, so when Derrida reads Rousseau, he says, the central assumption in all Rousseau's writing is that nature is primary, authentic, original, autonomous, uh, whereas culture is something secondary, derivative, Rousseau would say parasitical. Culture comes along later. It adds itself to nature. And again, Rousseau would say distorts nature and makes nature decadent. Um, um, and um, in the case of communication and miscommunication, um, and Derrida will eventually get into a, a long and rather bitter controversy with the philosopher John Searle um, about, about communication and about intention and about what letters or speech acts mean. But Derrida says, and again, it's a wager. Derrida often makes wagers. It's what he admires Freud for, and he does the same thing. Uh, he wages that um, we will learn far more about language and about texts, spoken or written language, um, if we recognize that all speech acts, all acts of writing, all texts um, are have a kind of inbuilt structural risk of being misunderstood. Um, so let's have a look at these two poems. Um, yeah. I'll read the uh, epigraphs because they help to provide a bit of, uh, of context. One of the paradoxes of destination is that if you wanted to demonstrate for someone that something never arrives at its destination, it's all over. Once the demonstration had achieved its aim, it would have proved what it was not supposed to demonstrate. But that, dear friend, is why I always say a letter can reach its destination, etc. But it need not always be a piece of luck. Um, now, what he's saying there is uh, he's trying to put people right about what he had said previously. Um, Derrida is famous for having um, read and written about a text by Lacan. Lacan I introduced earlier. He is the psychoanalytic theorist and the psychoanalyst. He's a practitioner as well as a theorist, or was, he is dead now, um, who um, wrote about Freud and um, Derrida, Derrida engaged with Lacan over Lacan's reading of a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, which is called The Poloined Letter. And Lacan took The Poloined Letter as a kind of allegory of psychoanalysis. The Poloined Letter is a, a detective story, and it is about, as the title says, it's about a letter that is stolen. The letter is stolen by a, um, a minister from the Queen. Um, it's a compromising letter. The Queen had had an affair with someone, and this letter, if it reached the King, would expose the affair, and she would be in a very embarrassing and probably very dangerous um, situation. So she engages the services of Dupin, the detective, who is a rather Sherlock Holmes-like figure. He's cleverer than the police. He's cleverer than the policeman who's investigating the case. And he knows that um, um, the letter was stolen from the Queen um, because um, the Queen had cunningly placed it in a very obvious place on the mantelpiece, in the most obvious place you could think. But she knew that um, she thought that the a thief, if a thief wanted to get the letter, he or she, the thief, would look in all kinds of obscure, pokey um, places, you know, false bottoms in drawers, for instance. They'd search around in the least obvious places. Whereas the letter was there on the mantelpiece. It was in full sight. It was hidden in plain view as the phrase goes. The thief was clever enough, the blackmailer was clever enough to steal it from that position, just right there, obvious as you like, on the on the mantelpiece. Um, but, um, and then the police um, search the rooms of the, um, of the thief, the minister who stole the letter, um, and they do the same thing. They look in all the obscure places, whereas in fact it's propped on the mantelpiece. Dupin is shrewd enough to know that um, if the blackmailer is clever, he will do the same thing. You'll probably anyway. You can see the um, the letter, the circulating letter, is the theme of the story. Lacan says this is like psychoanalysis. Lacan has read his sociur. He knows the difference between signifiers and signifieds. The signifier for La for Lacan for Lacanian psychoanalysis, the signifier is something that circulates and something that is elusive, can never be pinned down, it can never be captured. It can never be cashed out 
in a straightforward interpretation. It's something that teases thought, if you like. Um, so Lacan reads Edgar Allan Poe's short story as a kind of allegory of psychoanalysis. Derrida then comes along and points out that Lacan has missed, he has passed over um, a number of details of the story, and they are literary details. Um, Derrida basically says to Lacan that Lacan, in order to present this story as an allegory of psychoanalysis, has had to pass in silence over certain things which, if he'd noticed them, if he'd taken official notice of them, so to speak, would have disrupted or undermined or at least complicated his interpretation. So Derrida's point is that Lacan has, um, as it were, secured the ground for his own reading and for psychoanalysis, as opposed to literature, by strategically, if perhaps unwittingly, avoiding any mention of those details. Uh, Lacan was quite cross about this and came back and there was a long dispute and um, various um, mainly American English language commentators took up either sides of it. Um, but um, Derrida then came to feel that he'd been misrepresented um, because um, he wasn't saying that letters never arrive at their destination. He wasn't saying that we always miscommunicate, that communication is impossible. Um, and that's the point of this poem. This is Derrida's reply to that misinterpretation as he sees it. And it's interesting because he's saying two apparently conflicting things. He's saying we should always take into account the possibility of misinterpretation, whether we're talking about psychoanalysis, the talking cure, the Freudian talking cure, or we're talking about literary criticism, or whether we're talking about communication in a more general sense. Uh, the possibility of letters going astray. In Derrida's book, The Postcard, for instance, um, he's fascinated by the fact that a postcard is on the one hand, um, a very public thing, you know, uh, wh while the postcard is in the post, while it's being transmitted from the collecting office to the distrib distributing office, it can be picked up by a postal worker on bread, you know. So it's, it's a very public, open form of, of communication. But it's also a very cryptic form because it might just say, arrived yesterday, um, Jean-Pierre or something, um, or feeling fine, problem over, for instance. Now, to the recipient, that will mean a lot because the recipient, if it reaches its destination, will um, know the person concerned, recognize the name, be able to contextualize the very cryptic message in the postcard, and will find it perfectly transparent and clear. There will be no miscommunication. But to the person who intercepts it, let's say to the minister in Poe's story, um, there, there will be far more mystery and uh, enigma about it. Um, so these poems have to do with Derrida's return to the debate with um, with Lacan. And he's saying, you know, I'm not I'm not claiming that all letters go astray or that all texts are going to be subject to uh, to misreadings or misinterpretations or or calamities like the loss, the loss of the message. Um, the uh, the poem um, is a villanelle. Um, villanelle is um, um, a poem that takes the form of tercets, that is, three line stanzas, with uh, a pair of refrains, a pair of repeated lines, which alternate in the course of the poem. So it's a very musical form. The repetition gives it uh, um, a musical character, um, and also a very um, resonant form. It's 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 a very good form if you want to put in a lot of lot of meanings, because the refrains can sort of alternate or oscillate or vary through the course of the poem. They have the same wording, but different tone or a different point of view, or perhaps used ironically or something. Um, yeah. So not every letter finds the right address. We check the postcode, but they don't get through. Some unknown system glitch is our best guess. No text so clear it's destined to express the writer's gist, intent or point of view. Not every letter finds the right address. It's an old tale. Why fret when critics stress their own pet themes and twist the sense askew? Some widespread system glitch is our best guess. Check twice in proof before it went to press. How then should such anomalies accrue? Not every letter finds the right address. Of course, you'll always get the odd success. The text can serve, the mailman bang on cue. 
Some one-off system glitch is our best guess. For it's by destinerance we progress, past sending or receiving just what's due. Not every letter finds the right address. Why count those missing letters dead unless you've checked for postal codes you misconstrue? That we're the system glitch, that we're the system glitch is our best guess. Through glitch and swerve we're driven to confess such hit and miss the best that we can do, as one stray letter finds the right address. No sorter's care, no critic's faithfulness will keep their twin deliverances true. Systemic system glitch is our best guess. Not every letter finds the right address. Uh, that word destinerance uh, there in the first line of stanza three on page 29 is another of Derrida's coinages, his neologisms. Uh, destinerance. So it's a combination of um, uh, destination and errance, errance in the sense wandering or uh, departing from goal or departing from target address or whatever. So errance is, usually implies mistake. Derrida's point is that, um, again, it's to insist on this um, element of chance, the idea that uh, loss or misinterpretation or misconstrual may overtake the poem or the message or the postcard uh, for that matter. Um, so he's, um, as in much of his work, he's pulled two ways. On the one hand, he wants us to see that one way of learning about language, one way of learning about how language normally works when everything goes well, when our speech acts have a successful outcome, is to look at what goes wrong when they don't go well. OK, um, and this is something that his critics often find um, infuriating or baffling. In his debate with John Searle, the American uh, philosopher of speech acts, uh, Searle says, how can Derrida say that uh, the abnormal is the normal? You know, but Derrida's not saying that. What he's saying is that the abnormal may be studying the abnormal, instances of the abnormal, may be the best way of clarifying for ourselves what happens when things go straightforwardly, when speech acts work as intended. Um, and this, I think, is very important. It helps to explain a bit more about why Derrida was so welcome to critics like Hartman and Hillis Miller, the Yale School critics who were so eager to take up his ideas. Um, it's because the old new criticism that they were reacting against was strongly normative. Um, and its normative nature took the form very often of um, denying things or proscribing or um, um, ruling against things. For instance, um, intentions. Uh, the new critics talked a lot about the intentional fallacy. And what they meant by that was the fallacy or the, the mistake for literary critics of appealing to an author's intentions. And their reason for that was that they said intentions were private. Intentions were a matter of what went on in the poet's head when he or she was writing the poem, or in the time leading up to the writing of the poem, when it was forming itself in their minds. But the new critics thought it was illicit. It was, it was simply not good critical conduct, talk about intentions, because in the end, the words on the page are all you have. Um, one form the argument takes is the form it takes in, in an essay, a very famous essay called The Intentional Fallacy by two, two critics, Munro Beardsley and, um, W.K. Wimsat, and they say, well, okay, let's let's look at it. What, what might it be to discover a poet's intention other than through the poem? They say, what if you go to Dove Cottage? And that's where Wordsworth and Coleridge live for a while. It's just across the water from where I am here, as a matter of fact. In, uh, it's in Devon, I think, yeah. Um, so it's kept up as a tourist trust, you know, and you might be sitting in the living room in Wordsworth's cottage and you might feel down in, into the sofa, the back of the sofa, and fish out a bit of paper, you know, where Wordsworth had written, you, it's rather implausible, it could have remained there all that time without being discovered, but you find this piece of paper where he'd written, he'd written down, wrote this poem this morning, Lucy poem, and it's all about Lucy um, and... Um, let me, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll recite the poem, if I can remember the poem. It's um, um, uh, a spirit, a slumber, a slumber did my spirit steal. I had no earthly fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of mortal years. That's the first stanza. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. 
rolled round in Earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. So what you know from the poem, from the words on the page, is there was a girl, Lucy, whom Wordsworth knew. Of course, he might be making it up, but in the situation of the poem, as imagined by Wordsworth. And then she died. Um, um, and then the second stanza, there are two very short stanzas, but there's a real break in between them. No motion has she now, no force she neither hears nor sees, rolled round in Earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. So she's died in between. You know, the first one celebrates her as a living force, a part of nature in the sense that she's vibrant and um, wonderful. The second stanza is saying she's dead now and she's been absorbed back into the earth and she no longer has this vibrancy and energy and living grace and delightfulness. And, uh, you know, um, but then the note that you dig out from the sofa, um, Wordsworth's Cottage, um, might say, I wrote it in a, in a mood of elevated... Um, uplift and exaltation because I realize now she's part of nature and nature you know words of his poetry is all about nature and it celebrates nature and the living power of nature and Lucy although the girl Lucy is dead now she is a part of um this great um uh, organic uh, vibrant thing that includes human beings and animals and rocks and stones and trees and and this is the pantheist Wordsworth you know it's a kind of mystical uh, sense of um, of, of trans transcendent mystery of nature so it could be um, um, an affirmative poem you know a poem written in a mood of, um, of um, sort of not high spirits exactly but um, sort of spiritual buoyancy if you like or it could be um, a poem um, that of utter despair. You know, she is dead. That she's like a stone or a tree, or um, she's just a part of nature. She no longer exists as a human being, a living spirit. Um, and the new critics argue, well, you know, okay, you've got an evidence of um, words with intentions in some sense. He's written these things down. It has to do with the poem. But of course, it's told you nothing because the note doesn't display. Um, it doesn't e even if. Um, even if um, the note said, I felt wonderful about it because I've suddenly realised she's now a part of nature and that's a great thing and something to exalt and glory in. Um, that wouldn't mean he got it into the poem. The poem could have been gloomy and despairing and um, desolate, uh, despite Wordsworth's intentions. And even if it said, oh, she's gone now and lost and we will never see her like and so forth. It might be that there's hopefulness in the poem quite apart from whatever it was that Wordsworth thought when he wrote the note. He might have misconstrued his own thoughts, misremembered them, or the poem might have taken on a life of its own. So this was the new critical argument against intentions. And yet it's one that they couldn't stick to themselves without drastically narrowing the scope of their interpretations. Um, now, Derrida is much more liberal in his um, understanding of intentions. If you read his essays on, um, on poetry, um, he's constantly talking about the poet's situation, the poet's um, historical circumstances, when he writes about Paul Celan, the German uh, poet. Um, um, he says these poems are powerful, and they communicate a sense of uh, enormous urgency and imaginative power, too. Um, partly because we take account of their historical... So he's not saying we should simply read poems in light of our knowledge of their background history, but he is saying it can play um, a useful and necessary uh, part in our understanding of the poem. So um, this is yet another source of his appeal for critics like Hartman and, um, and Hillis Miller. The fact that he is not defining the scope or the uh, the proper scope of of, of, uh, of a critic's um, uh, knowledge in that prescriptive way that the the old new critics were. Okay, so that's the first of these um, poems. I'll go back now to page twenty nine, the second letters poem. Um, so page twenty nine, toward the bottom of the page, that most arrive. That much we can't deny. With letters, as with texts, the slips are rare. How spot them if the fail rate goes too high? We'll just lose track once errors multiply beyond the point where we can cross compare. That most arrive, that much we can't deny. At Lake or Freudienne, the alumni take Lacan's lead, find errors everywhere. How spot them if the fail rate goes too high? I read him and perceive the alibi he seeks in saying male men always err, that most arrive, that much we can't deny, 
There's things you won't allow to signify, like that last bait in Poe's ingenious snare. How spot them if the fail rate goes too high? It's just such telling twists elude the eye of letter sleuths who fail to read what's there. That most arrive, that much we can't deny. Poe's tricksy narrative may help us spy truths waiting post restant, still fit to share. I'll spot them if the fail rate goes too high, that most arrive, that much we can't deny. So this is very much what Derrida is saying in his later um, return to the whole debate around the Poe story and Lacan's reading of it. Um, there must be certain norms in place before we can recognise a departure from the norm. And that applies to his readers, to his, his readings of philosophical texts. Um, when he reads Plato or reads um, uh, Rousseau, or reads herself for that matter, um, he fully accepts that there are interpretive norms, but he also says that when we read in accordance with those norms, we will occasionally hit up against problematic passages or things that raise serious questions um, about what the text is saying. And sometimes the text will go in a direction that conflicts with what the author said about it. Husserl is perfectly clear about what he wants to do in phenomenology. And we'll take this as the last example today, so as not to go on too uh, too long. Um, Husserl is quite clear. He wishes phenomenology, what he calls transcendental phenomenology, to be scientific, to be logic-based, to be clear, distinct, lucid. He wants it to be very much in the line of descent from Descartes. Uh, he looks back to Descartes as being a kind of exemplar of what philosophy ought to be. Descartes, famously in the 17th century, um, set himself to refute scepticism. In other words, he wanted to establish that certain things could be known and they could be known for sure. And among them were things about science, about mathematics, about physical sciences. And he thought the only way to do that was to entertain the most far-reaching doubts about everything, and then survive even the most um, full-strength, corrosive doubt that he could devise. So he imagined himself to be first the victim of a dream that systematically deluded him as to the evidence of the senses, and then a kind of demonic um, um, sceptical um, demon, yeah, a demon of doubt, who would induce him to doubt the most apparently self-evident things about his body and about the surrounding world and about all the sensory experience that up to then he'd taken to be beyond doubt, to be indubitable. Um, and Descartes famously says, well, there's one thing I can't doubt. Um, in Latin, it's cogito ego sum. I think, therefore, I am. And he says, there must be an I that is doing that thinking. In the act of thinking, I think, therefore, I am. Um, that is where I am, if you like. that. This, uh, the one thing that can't be doubted about that proposition is the I that's doing the thinking at the same time that it utters the proposition. Um, now, there's lots of big problems with that. Um, um, and um, the problems are pointed out by Lacan, among others. Uh, Lacan says, and uh, Derrida follows him to a point in this, um, Derrida says that Descartes' formula, cogito ego sum, I think, therefore I am, is in fact not the proof that he thought it was. Lacan says, in, in his typically riddling way, Lacan writes in a very um, semantically dense, very Joycean way sometimes. He was influenced by the Surrealists. He actually um, moved in Surrealist circles for a while in his um, early life. Um, um, Lacan says, we should rewrite cogito ego sum, I think, therefore I am, as cogito ego sum ubi cogito, ibi non sum. Where I think, I think, therefore I am, that's where I am not. And uh, Lacan's thinking of Freud and the unconscious and the fact that for Freud, the ego is the plaything of the, the id. The ego is not at all what Descartes thought it was, you know, the self-present, punctual, self-knowing, self-reflecting um, um, ego of, of traditional philosophical thinking. On the contrary, the ego does not know itself. Even in the act of saying, I think, therefore I am, the ego is being spoken by something other than itself. 
or there are two selves in that sentence. I think, therefore, I am. There's the, the I that thinks and the I that speaks, the I of the enunciation. Um, so there's all kinds of problems with Descartes. But what Rousseau wants to do is to cut through those problems by going to the most basic, primordial, indispensable components of human intelligence. Um, what Derrida shows is that this is, in the end, an impossible project, but a necessary project. And that's one of the things that Derrida is constantly saying, that things that, um, projects that prove ultimately to be aporetic, uh, he uses the word aporia quite a lot. Um, and aporia is something stronger than a paradox. A paradox is a contradiction that settles down into part of a belief system. If you think of religious paradoxes, the paradoxes of, um, of the great world religions, um, very often religious truths are couched in the form of paradoxes, things which, according to classical logic, would be considered contradictory and therefore untenable, but which, according to religious thought, are felt to be deeper than human logic or deeper than human reason. OK, so if you accept something as a paradox, then you're implying, yes, this contradicts what we count to be elementary laws of logical thinking. But it does so because it goes deeper than those laws. There are truths beyond those that could be accounted for in terms of logical consequence or entailment. Um, and Aporia is something um, tougher, more difficult, more resistant and worrisome than that. Um, let me... Um, can I have one more poem now? Is that okay? Have we got time? Um, professor, um, can we resume your session at uh, 1 p.m. of your time? Because okay, yes, 1 p.m. Yeah, that'll be absolutely fine. So yes, it's, so almost, it's almost 11.30, right? Yeah, okay, right, <laughs> right. Yes, I lose track of time. It's yeah. Uh, it'd be fine. Yeah, if I go on too long this afternoon, just stop me, will you? Yes, just interrupt. Sure. That'd be absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor, one more, one more thing. So we got a couple of uh, questions in the chat box. So can we take up those questions towards the end of the second session? Or is more yeah, that be fine. Yes. Okay. So it's one o'clock my time, isn't it? We yeah, start. one o'clock. Yeah. So yeah, I, I shared the link already. You can use that link to join for the second meeting. Oh, yes. I've got the second. I've got two links. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the second one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry to keep you so long. So <laughs> we'll, um, we'll start at one o'clock prompt. Okay. Good. Okay. See you, see you later then. Thank you, thank you. So okay. uh, thank you okay. for thank you for the beautiful information informative session, sir. And now we have come to the end of our lecture today. Dr. Christopher Norris himself will be continuing with the very next session at 6:45 today. It was indeed our pride and privilege to have you with us today. Feedback form are provided in the chat box. Once again, I thank everyone for your active participation throughout the session. A very special thanks to our faculty, Dr. Christopher Morris, for your valuable words as well as time. Once again, thank you all.